Yes. And what about the suggestion from another Conservative MP that you should be denied your civil service pension? Well, I was denied all sorts of things when I was um, forced to resign in April 2009. So if they want to take my pension away as well, then that's up to them. You're not trying to elicit our sympathy, are you? No, no, not at all. Not at all. And as you said earlier, I've been well paid for writing this book. But if, you know, if that's what the civil service wants to do, if they think that's appropriate, then that's up to them. But I'm not going to sit here and plead that I, you know, I need to keep my civil service pension. Of course, it raises the question whether we can believe a word in the book, doesn't it? Well, all I'd say is if people read this book, they'd see that I haven't hidden anything. I haven't taken anything out. I've been very honest, not only about what I did, but about myself and the impact it had on me and my personal life. And I don't think many people read this book and think that they're, you know, reading someone that's trying to obscure the truth or be dishonest. Is there anyone here who, listening to this account of what life was like, I mean, the heart of power in this country, I mean, what does it make you think about politics? Yes, sir, you in the second row, please. Uh, I think it's very indicative of the way society has become and how challenging this country is now. I don't feel there's a great left in Great Britain because of the damage done by our right. last government. There's a chap up with his hand up behind you. Go on. I feel that, the, that what you've done is part of, you said, the system. Me or Damien. Damien. Right. What Damien's done is part of the system. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, do you not co concern yourself with actually causing the, uh, you know, the downfall of the Labour Party? Well, I don't think this will happen. I mean, I'd, I'd frankly say I don't think this will make a single difference to how anyone casts their vote at the next election. It might be sort of making a few people, you know, look, look inside now, but I don't think it will make any difference to the, the outcome of the next election, so I, I disagree with you. But how you behaved and what it's done to trust in politics, mm. that must trouble you, doesn't it? It does, but, you know, what, what would be more damaging than that is to pretend that these things don't happen and, and not to be honest about it. I mean, wh whenever you've had these kind of periods, I, I, I compare it to the banking crisis. When you, when you think about the banking crisis, if all we'd heard was, was that the individuals that were responsible for those kind of you know, catastrophic failures in the banking crisis were swept under the carpet, then we'd never try and clean up that system. Yes, you've got um, your hand up in the second row. You, you talked to him in the VT, almost as it was going altruistic gesture on your part in terms of preventing Labour from making the same mistakes. Not only have you caused you know, damage to the Labour Party, but also just to Jeremy's point, the perception of the public who are really fatigued and you know, very cynical about politics in general. Now, how do you feel about that? I'd hope that when people would read the book as a whole, they'd see both that this is, you know, a problem of the system that needs to be fixed so that our politics can be fixed, a bit, a bit like the expenses scandal. And when we had the expenses scandal, clearly there were people who were sort of, you know, almost mild offenders, but there were serious offenders, and I would regard myself as one of those in this context. And hopefully that's the only way you can really clean up the system is to get to the bottom of why those things happened. Do you still talk to people at the top of the Labour Party, or do they talk to you? Uh, I haven't done for several months precisely because I was writing this book. When did you last speak to Ed Balls? I bumped into him walking to the, the Arsenal match against, I can't remember who we were playing, I think it was home to Liverpool. Just chance. Yeah. He was, uh, he was uh, going to meet Robert Peston, who has a far closer relationship than I do. Ed Miliband? Uh, I haven't seen Ed Miliband since we bumped into each other again in the park about uh, three or four years ago. OK, you sir in the front row. Predecessor Alistair Campbell seems to have come through similar actions and is now sort of a media darling, so perhaps there's a, a chance for you to redeem yourself. There's a lady, um, the row, two rows back, with the blonde hair. Go on, please. I'm, I'm really curious if the police decide that you have committed a criminal offence, will you then just say it was all a pack of lies again, which would be actually, <laughs> of course, more believable than what you're actually sitting there saying? Uh, no, I'm, and I wouldn't be able to because I've been very clear in the book about exactly what stories I was responsible for briefing. So, you know, if the police wanted to say, well, that story was a was a breach of the law, then, then you know, I'd, I'd be banged to rights. But uh, that's the honest truth. Well, and then perhaps if you were in prison, would you write the sequel in April 2015? <laughs> I'm not sure people would be as interested in that. Oh, I think they might be. <laughs> There's a gentleman over here with his hand up. Come on. Damien, if you're truly sorry about the damage you've done to the Labour Party, how about donating your fee to the Labour Party to redeem yourself and uh, make amends? Mm. Well, the fact is, when I left government, when I left the Labour Party, I left with nothing. Uh, I got, no, I'm not saying I should have done, but I did leave with nothing. I built, built up a lot of debts during that period, and the majority of the money that I make from writing this book will go to paying off those debts. That's the reality. I'd be very interested to know, how do you rate the current spin operation in the Labour Party? Are they as good as you? 
Uh, it depends what you think I was good at. They're certainly... Um, well, you obviously thought you were pretty good at the time. I think I was good at certain things, and, and there are things that haven't necessarily come out from the Daily Mail. I think even people in the Labour Party and the Conservative Party will read from this book and say, well, we'd like to have someone that was doing that kind of job. The sort of 24-7 monitoring of the media and making sure that bad stories about the government as much as possible did not appear. Even the stories that I've, I've talked about leaking, I did those in positive ways. You know, if I, I, you know, take the Charles Clark and Louise Casey stories. Those were all positive stories about what this government was going to do to tackle antisocial behaviour. There were other stories that certainly don't fall into that no, category. No, that's right. But the majority of things that I did over the years were about positively promoting the government and a huge amount of stopping... Would you ever go stopping. back into politics? I don't think politics would have me, uh, quite rightly. <laughs> OK, one last question. Um, you, you had a team that worked with you, so you didn't do a... Um, but do this by yourself, and they all kept quiet. So how can you justify that, that they kept quiet, and um, why, why didn't they speak? Well, strangely, the fact is I didn't have a team. Uh, for the entire period, when I was head of, head of communications at the Treasury, I had a large Treasury press office, but they didn't, weren't involved in this with civil servants. When I was a special advisor, a press advisor to Gordon Brown, I was largely doing that on my own. Did that all by yourself? Yeah. And, and, you know, and I describe okay. exactly how. Damien, right, thanks very much. Okay.